The Hours, Michael Cunningham, Mrs. Wolfe. She looks at the clock on the table. Almost two hours have passed. She still feels powerful, though she knows that tomorrow she may look back at what she's written and find it airy, overblown. One always has a better book in one's mind than one can imagine to get onto paper. She takes a sip of cold coffee and allows herself to read what she's written so far. It seems good enough. Parts seem very good indeed. She has lavish hopes, of course. She wants this to be her best book, the one that finally matches her expectations, but can a single day in the life of an ordinary woman be made into enough of a novel? Virginia taps at her lips with her thumb. Clarissa Dalloway will die. Of that she feels certain. Though this early, it's impossible to say how or even precisely why. She will, Virginia believes, take her own life. Yes, she will do that. Virginia lays down her pen. She would like to write all day, to fill thirty pages instead of three, but after the first hour, something within her falters, and she worries that if she pushes beyond her limits, she will taint the whole enterprise. She will let it wander into a realm of incoherence from which it might never return. At the same time, she hates spending any of her cogent hours doing anything but writing. She works always against the fear of relapse. First comes the headaches, which are not in any way ordinary pain. Headache has always seemed an inadequate term for them, but to call them by any other name would be too melodramatic. They infiltrate her. They inhabit rather than merely afflict her. The way viruses inhabit their hosts, strands of pain announce themselves, throw shivers of brightness into her eyes, so insistently she must remind herself the others can't see them. Pain colonizes her, quickly replaces what was Virginia with more and more of itself, and its advance so forceful, its jagged contour so distinct, that she can't help imagining it as an entity with life of its own. She might see it while working with Leonard in the square, a scintillating silver-white mass floating over the cobblestones, randomly spiked fluid hulled like a jellyfish. What's that? Leonard would ask. It's my headache, she'd answer. Please ignore it. The headache is always there, waiting, and her periods of freedom, however long, always feel provisional. Sometimes the headache simply takes partial possession for an evening or a day or two, then withdrawals. Sometimes it remains and increases until she herself subsides. At those times, the headache moves out of her skull and into the world. Everything glows and pulses. Everything is infected with brightness, throbbing with it. And she prays for dark the way a wanderer lost in the desert prays for water. The world is every bit as barren of darkness as a desert is of water. There is no dark in a shuttered room, no dark behind her eyelids. There are only greater and lesser degrees of radiance. When she's crossed over to this realm of relentless brilliance, the voices start. Sometimes they are low, disembodied grumblings that coals out of the air itself. Sometimes they emanate from behind furniture or inside the walls. They are distinct but full of meaning, undeniably masculine, obscenely old. They are angry, accusatory, disillusioned. They seem sometimes to be conversing in whispers among themselves. They seem something to be reciting text. Sometimes, faintly, she can distinguish a word, hurl, once and under on two occasions. A flock of sparrows outside her window once sang unmistakably in Greek. This state makes her hellishly miserable. In this state, she is capable of shrieking at Leonard or anyone else who comes near fizzling like devils with light, and yet this state, when protracted, also begins to enshroud her hour by hour like a chrysalis. Eventually, when enough hours have passed, she emerges bloodied, trembling, but full of vision and ready. Once she's rested to work again, she dreads her lapses into pain and light, and she suspects they are necessary. She has been free for quite some time now, for years, she knows how suddenly the headache can return, but she discounts it in Leonard's presence, acts more firmly healthy than she sometimes feels. She will return to London, better to die raving mad in London than evaporate in Richmond. She decides with misgivings that she is finished for today. Always there are doubts. She, should she try another hour? Is she being judicious or slothful? Judicious, she tells herself, and almost believes it. She has her 250 words, more or less, let it be enough. Have faith that you will be here, 
recognizable to yourself again tomorrow. She takes her cup with its cold dregs and walks out of the room and down the stairs to the printing room where Ralph is reading the page, proofs as Leonard finishes with them. Good morning, Ralph says brightly and nervous to Virginia. His broad, placid, handsome face is red, his forehead practically aglow, and she can immediately see that for him it is not a good morning at all. Leonard must have growled at some inefficiency either of recent vintage or left over from yesterday, and now Ralph sits reading proofs and saying good morning with the flushed ardency of a scolded child. Good morning, she answers in a voice that is cordial but carefully unsympathetic. These young men and women, these assistants will come and go. Already Marjorie has been hired with her terrible drawl, and where is she just now? To do the jobs Ralph considers beneath him. It won't be long, surely, before Ralph and then Marjorie have gone on, and she, Virginia, emerges from her study to find someone new wishing her a red-faced, chastened good morning. She knows Leonard can be gruff, stingy, and all but impossibly demanding. She knows these young people are often criticised unfairly, but she will not side with them against him. She will not be a mother who intervenes, much as they beg her to, with their eager smile and wounded eyes. Ralph, after all, is light and worry. Light and is welcome to join him. He, like his brothers or sisters to come, will go on and do whatever they do in the greater world. No one expects them to make a career out of assisting at the press. Leonard may be autocratic, he may be unfair, but he is her companion and caretaker, and she will not betray him, certainly not for handsome. Callow Ralph for Marjorie with her parakeet's voice. There are ten hours and eight pages, Leonard says. The brackets around his mouth are so deep you could slip a penny in. Lucky to have found them, Virginia says. They seem to congregate around the middle section. Do you think bad writing actually attracts a higher incidence of misfortune? How I'd love to live in a world in which that were true. I'm going for a walk to clear my head and then I'll come and pitch in. We're making good progress, says Ralph. We should be through by end of day. We shall be lucky, Leonard says, to be through by this time next week. He glowers. Ralph turns a finer and more precise shade of red. Of course, she thinks. Ralph sets the type and he did it carelessly. The truth, she thinks, sits calmly and pumply, dressed in a matronly grey, between these two men. It does not reside with Ralph, the younger foot soldier who appreciates literature, but also appreciates with equal or perhaps greater fervor the brandy and biscuits waiting when the day's work is done, who is good-hearted and unexceptional and can barely be counted to, on to perpetuate, is his allotted span, the ordinary business of the ordinary world, and the truth likewise does not, alas, preside with Leonard, brilliant and indefatigable Lord Leonard, who refuses to distinguish between setback and catastrophe, who worships accomplishment above all else and makes himself unbearable to others, because he genuinely believes he can root out and reform every incidence of human fecalness and mediocrity. I'm sure, she says that between us we can get the book into some sort of acceptable shape and still have Christmas. Ralph grins at her with a relief so visible she has an urge to slap him. He overestimates her sympathy. She has spoken not on his behalf but on Leonard's, in much the way her own mother might have made the light of a servant's blunder during dinner, declaring for the sake of her husband and all others, present this shattered tureen portended nothing and that the circle of love and forbearance could not be broken, that all were safe.